Okay, I think this is the last podcast in this food section of a Drawdown and it focuses on managed grazing. We have talked about the environmental impacts of uh, raising livestock. We have talked about various resource requirements like water and it, uh, so on. Managed grazing is part of that, uh, which uh, ranks at number 19. Uh, with the potential for reducing CO2 by 16.34 gigatons. Uh, the net cost is estimated at $50.5 billion, but net savings are a whopping $735.3 billion, right? This is a happy picture of cows mob grazing on Brown's Ranch in North Dakota. So the idea is to worry about what is the best way to graze them to get the best uh, production out of the cattle as well as manage the land, the ecosystem, the soil, uh, and so on. Uh, global meat production has gone up pretty continuously from 1961 onwards. There is a very close relation between per capita GDP increase and meat consumption and fish consumption, of course, also with the waste of uh, food and so on. So here it is in million tons uh, for various regions. So Asia, which has grown tremendously in population as well as cattle, so they also export a lot of the meat. So it's not just for internal consumption. Uh, India, for example, I think is one of the biggest beef exporters. Europe, a lot of internal consumption and export. North America, South America, Central America, Africa, and Oceania, which includes Australia and so on. <clears throat> Looking at the share of uh, cereals allocated to human food in 2017. This is indicative of just how food is now also treated, crops are also treated as animal feed, not just human feed. So this is the share of domestic cereal supply after connect correcting for trade, which is al allocated to direct human consumption as opposed to being used for animal feed or industrial uh, uses such as a biofuel. Corn, for example, goes into making mm, mm, ethanol as a fuel additive. So th there is some relation, of course, between uh, the wealth of the country and how much is used for human versus animal feed. So you can see that countries like Canada and US and uh, here uh, is France, uh, is it France or is it Spain? Spain probably using, uh, I hope I'm right, uh, yes, uh, so using uh, a very low percentage of the cereals for human feed, of course they eat a lot of other things as well, whereas countries like uh, India and many African countries using almost all of it for human uh, food. Uh, share of the cereals allocated to animal feed is of course complementary to that. Uh, this is, you can see Canada, almost 100% for animal feed, uh, Brazil, uh, Australia and uh, Russia and many European countries. So this is the um, interaction between agriculture and cattle uh, and how the grazing is impacted by what they are actually fed and how they are raised is uh, industrial uh, cattle farming where they are uh, confined to a feeding lot and they are fed uh, industrial production of uh, hay and grass and uh, cereals and uh, wheat, corn, whatever else, right? So grading, grazing land use over the long term from 1600 to 2016 in hectares has also obviously gone up. Uh, so you can see the continuous increase uh, Oceania and Africa where the population was uh, relying on grazing and animals whereas the other regions uh, especially after industrial revolution took off uh, with industrial farming and other ways uh, you can see the various growths here Russia remains pretty flat Europe uh, excluding Russia remains flat because over this time uh, the continents were defined uh, slightly differently. There is Brazil, Latin America, Caribbean, Middle East, uh, 
India is over here, China, and so on and so forth. Okay, so all the main message is that the land used for grazing has gone up as well, and along with that come the uh, industry, uh, the environmental impacts uh, of how uh, grazing happens. <clears throat> In the natural world, if you look at white-bearded wild wildebeest uh, herds uh, massing together during the annual Serengeti migration, this photograph approximates uh, what all herd animals do which is uh, to stick to relatively close to uh, to stick relatively close together while continuously moving on grassy rangelands by herding animals protect the young from hyenas lions and other predators that uh, track the migrations managed grazing makes use of fences and short rotation times to imitate range behavior in order to optimize the health of the animals and regenerate land. So here they uh, herd together, they graze together, they stomp on the ground, they allow their own uh, organic byproducts, feces, uh, urine to mix into the soil and they go away, migrate and they come back after a year so there is a natural regeneration happening. This has evolved over many uh, millennia, uh, millions of years even, but when humans do uh, industrialize uh, cattle production, uh, in the course of this, uh, there is some examples we can take from uh, people who focused especially on how grazing works. André Vazin, uh, a French uh, scientist, uh, did a lot of work. He homed in on two cave key variables how long an animal grazes on a specific grassland and how long the land rests before the animals return. So there is that gap between exploiting the grassland and then moving off and then coming back. Achieving optimal results in the cow-grass relationship came to be known as managed grazing. There are three basic managed grazing techniques that improve soil health, carbon sequestration, water retention, and forage productivity, which is what you are looking for. <coughs> there is no blueprint that you can take and apply. It depends on uh, various factors. Uh, improved continuous grazing adjusts standard grazing practices, essentially a pasture free for all, so you just let them graze on their own. And this method avoids overgrazing by decreasing the number of animals per acre. So you just modify the free grazing by limiting the number of animals per acre. Rotational grazing systematically moves livestock to fresh paddocks or pastures, allowing those already grazed to recover. So it depends on how much land you have and how much uh, how many paddocks or pastures you can create so that you can rotate uh, giving each uh, paddock enough time to recover. Adaptive multi-paddock grazing, sometimes known as mob grazing, is the most intensive of these three methods shown here. It shifts animals to and from smaller paddocks in quick succession after which land is uh, given time to recover a month in a warm wet climate or a year in a cooler drier climate and there are lots of details that uh, you can actually see the increase in carbon content of the soil uh, how the grass uh, and the microbes are interacting with each other and how the grass and the mycorrhizae which are the symbiotic uh, uh, fungi that interact with the roots of the plants and grasses are responding and the fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi even produce chemical called glomalin I think which has sticky properties which changes the structure of the soil itself to allow for better regeneration so those are the kind of details that uh, one must consider here is Gabe Brown kneeling in a cover crop of plantain, uh, daikon radish, annual ryegrass, triticale, crimson clover, phacelia, and lentils. There is a smart guy mixing all sorts of things. And you can see that uh, the green uh, land here is used for grazing, but the uh, crop uh, mix and the rotation of managed grazing. Uh, has increased the soil carbon substantially. So many farmers report uh, this kind of managed grazing leading to uh, 
reductions in user need for fertilizers, uh, herbicides, uh, weed removers, pesticides, and so on. And there is, in general, increase in uh, productivity of the cattle themselves in terms of meat, milk, and other products. Okay. By enhancing carbon sequestration compared to standard grazing practices, managed grazing can sequester 16.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2050. Region-specific choices have to be made for what is the best method for that uh, land and number of cattle. Note that this does not reduce the 10 gigatons of methane that are emitted on that grazing land uh, today. Growth in adoption of managed grazing practice would need to ra uh, rise from 195 million acres to 1.1 billion acres over 30 years. Financial returns are $735 billion by 2050 on just a $51 billion addition, dollar additional investment. So that's one of our great uh, uh, no regret solutions as well. Uh, I think this is the last podcast under food. I'll check. Uh, if not, we will conclude this section here. Okay.